everyone. Um, can you hear me all right, or do I need to talk louder? A little louder? Okay, I will, I will try to talk louder, and if I don't, if I'm not loud enough, give me the thumbs in the back there so I know what to do. We're going to back up just a little bit from the presentation Tom just gave on the current status of our open course library and talk about the culture of sharing that we've developed in our system of 34 community and technical colleges in the state of Washington. So it's a little, this is a little creation story that I'm going to tell you, um, which I always like to do. The distance, distant past. I'm not currently, there you go. The wild rule of the land. Our 34 community technical colleges created a single student management system, uh, which we actually still use today and um, are trying really hard to move off of. But, <laughs> but it was a great idea 30 years ago. And because we all have the same student management system, some possibilities existed. And the, the point that I'm going to try to illustrate here is that a culture of sharing increases opportunities for sharing, even if after a certain amount of time those artifacts or those programs uh, become outdated, that culture of sharing will persist. <coughs> So time passes, like 30 years. Ah, sorry. This is... I'm not aiming it right. Um, in 1997, our colleges formed a consortium to create and share completely online courses. And uh, so we started with 20 courses that constitute an AA degree. And we started with a process not unlike the one we're using with the Open Course Library, which is we hired faculty to develop the courses. Um, they were built and taught by the faculty, and they were freely available. In, in, and we, when we opened them in 1998, we, we would give them to anyone. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll, I'm going to show you a chart that will show you what happened with that. Um, because we shared that student management system, though, we were also able to pool enrollments very easily in those courses. So one college adopts a course and puts five students in, and another college puts in two students, and another college puts in six students. And among the 34 colleges, you get full sections. And this was a very effective way to build online uh, course delivery because the content was free and there was a possibility of sharing and because we were building uh, a, a capacity not only in courses but also in trained faculty and in uh, course development. So we really like this pooled enrollment system. It allows students to access all the courses and, and services at one institution. So the student enrolls at one institution. They may be taking courses that are taught at another institution, but to the student it appears a local course. All their grades are together, all of that. It allowed our colleges to offer a wider variety of courses and also to serve a small number of students. Maybe they only have a few students each quarter who need a certain class. Um, they could throw those students into the pool. And we also think those uh, courses are uh, flexible and efficient. We can scale them up or down. Well, probably by the end of the presentation, I'll figure out where to point this thing. <laughs> and, and this is what happened. Uh, this starts in fall of 2003, and before that, it, it was growing kind of the same. But the top line, the blue line, is total e-learning, and you can see that there is a tremendous growth. And the green line is the non-shared courses. But the shared courses, pretty straight right across the bottom. And actually right now they're dropping even further. It's dramatically dropping right now. So. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? What, what we thought is, we thought, hey, success. We thought we, we did what we set out to do, which was to jumpstart this process. We created courses, we shared them out, gave them to people free, figured out a way to offer them, and look what happened to e-learning. Our goal was to create access for students, done. And so it worked. But at the same time, um, there are those courses. You know, they're shareable, they're open, but they're not getting used anymore. So what do you do about that? We thought about it. Why is it that these courses are no longer being shared? Or why, or why does that number stay so low? And one thing that we're pretty sure of is that faculty don't want a whole course. They don't want to take a course and say, oh, all right, there it is. Now I'm going to A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, teach this course. And that's what we were offering them. And in fact, we know that usually when faculty took those courses, and copied them, 
they just used them as a, a beginning point. They might not have even used the course itself, only looked at it as a model. They may have kept only a, a few pieces of it and changed it over time. So to us, the logical outgrowth of that was uh, the Open Course Library, which Tom's going to talk about in a minute. Um, and, and another factor here that builds into this is that um, in 2007, our system put together a strategic technology plan. And the strategy one was to create a single system-wide suite of online teaching and learning tools. Um, so this is sharing, once again, but sharing not only the courses, but also technology. And so we have, um, since then, geez, there we go. <laughs> Um, we share these services and tools. We've got Angel, as uh, Tom mentioned, Tabri Collaborate, we've got the Northwest Tutoring Consortium. If anybody wants to join, by the way, it's a great opportunity for tutoring with your, um, it's a, a, a collaborative, uh, very inexpensive way to provide e-tutoring to all your students, um, open to anyone. Professional development and the Open Course Library, which um, we're going to talk a little bit more about. So we get all of these things um, that become, that I think grow out of that idea of once you share something and start working as a, as a group, then the opportunities to share other things um, uh, appear. And, um, and people are immediately can buy into the next thing because they know that it's worked in the past. The Open Course Library we see as the logical um, extension of those first open courses that we did in 1998 in that there's a whole course and, and somebody can take the whole course if they want but what's more likely is that they'll see all the pieces of content and say oh I could use this and I could use that and I'll mix these things together and then create the course and this will more closely match the way instructors build courses and, and, and that's our theory and uh, we'll see starting on Monday if we're correct or not I'm now running on reserve battery power, Tom. <laughs> because and because of that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. <laughs> and, <laughs> and actually, this is where it leads in that we, we will cultivate the practice, the culture and practice of using and contributing to open resources, part of that technology plan that I mentioned before, sharing the technology, but also developing open resources, which by definition are shareable. All right, good luck, Tom. So speaking of, uh, speaking of open sharing, does anyone have a, a, a Mac uh, power cable that they're willing to share openly for now? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, it probably could have even reached. Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Wow, that's awesome. Just barely in. You could ask for PC. Look at that. That's gorgeous. Okay. Now you can hand it back to her. No. <laughs> That's right. It's all you. Okay. So, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about. Did you mention the, the strategic technology? I did. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think the um, the other element of that I want to highlight from the strategic technology plan is um, just that it it had baked into it this um, this goal of of engaging in OER. So from the strategic technology plan, it says, we will cultivate the culture and practice of using and contributing to open educational resources, um, which I think is significant in a policy document. And, and again, it's something that we used. We leveraged that as people, when people were asking, why are we doing this open thing? You know, um, this was, once you get um, the policy problem solved, then you lean on that to, to get your buy-in. Um, in other places, and so, um, so anyway, for us, you know, it was kind of a logical next step. We had the internet, we had digital content. What, what, what were we missing? Okay, everyone had those two, and it wasn't really, you know, we still weren't lowering costs and increasing access. So the open license is was the key, and so, um, so with with all of the other um, pieces that were sort of fitting into this puzzle. We also had the, the um, open licensing policy that came along right around the same time. So this was just, uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, and basically that says that any, um, any optional, uh, optional grant money that comes through the state board, uh, of, comes through
to the state board actually requires that the material being created by that money is then openly licensed and, and shared back. So it's, it's really a key piece um, uh, to our strategy of you know, efficiency and, and, um, and really working, um, working to, to in increase access, increase quality, and lower cost. So, um, so this is just from the College Board report, um, just a, a, a data point that full-time full students spend now well over $1,000, closer to $1,200 um, on textbooks every year. Now, if you're in a two-year college in the state of Washington, you know, your tuition is right around, um, uh, right around $3,500, $3,600, and then you add $1,200, I mean that's that's 25 percent more, uh, you know, on top of your tuition that that you have to come up with. I mean your total outlay increases by a quarter to to you know because of textbooks. And so again, for us that just that wasn't acceptable, and we we started looking at ways to ways to bring that down. And our good friends at uh, <laughs> the student Fergs, um, Nicole, I don't think is. In the room right now, but um, but anyway, um, Nicole went uh, literally cross country, 40 universities, and just bless her for uh, having gone through that six weeks of, of a road trip um, with these very fun um, sort of SpongeBob like looking puppets. <laughs> uh, and uh, the textbook rebellion really drove drove home the point that this this is not okay. You know the the way that the way that uh, textbook costs keep skyrocketing is not okay. And, um, and so just I, I think that um, the first step in, in solving a problem is just realizing that you have a problem. And so this is a, a great awareness campaign that Nicole Allen um, and uh, Flat World Knowledge put together. Um, another, another point that's important here is that even in our, you know, even in the state of Washington, which by the way, Nicole's last two stops were in, uh, let's see, UW and, um, and Evergreen College, just right, right near where I live. And, uh, and it was, and so I think, and she, she leveraged grassroots support from, you know, at every college. She had uh, student advocates that were, that were um, you know, dressing up in the puppet outfit, getting out there, talking to their, their fellow students. And, um, and we have the same thing in Washington. Uh, we have Student Voice Academy. We have students who are mobilizing um, around, around issues. And interestingly, the top issue three years running is cutting textbook costs. So is this a pain point for students? Absolutely. So and then just an example, but um, you know, in English Composition 1, we have in the in our two-year colleges in Washington, we have 50,000 plus enrollments. If you're saving, or if you can save $100 per textbook, which is just, you know, that's a, a low number, actually, um, then that's $5 million saved to students every year. Well, why are we so adamant about saving students money? Well, because number one, if they can't buy the textbook, they're not going to do very well in the class. I mean, that's, that's clear. Um, student perks has done research around that, and, and it's, um, you know, and, and that shows. The other thing is that students are taking out student loans to be able to afford the cost of their education. So, um, and many of those loans are subsidized by state and, uh, state and federal government. So, so really we should all care. Um, it's not just saving students money, it's actually saving all of us money. Um, and so just a little bit on some of the legislation that, that has, has led us to this point. And, and I, I think it's important to point out that this progression that Connie described is is really just that. I mean, we um, we started with this idea that um, that we could do things more efficiently by sharing our enrollments, and and it progressed from there. And um, so, using um, using the the legislative um, uh, influences, because uh, legislators get the idea that this is um, an important efficiency, especially in difficult economic times, um, but really any time, it makes sense to get the most out of your dollar. Um, so one of the things in um, House Bill 1025 
uh, we added just a little piece right here. So this was an existing piece of legislation that says, look, you need to consider the least expensive um, option, if, you know, all things being equal. And we went ahead and included open textbooks as one of the options there. And I think, uh, again, each little step bringing you closer to um, convincing that, convincing others that that open education is okay, and they have permission to go there. And that's, I think, um, that's where all these little steps lead. So again, um, substitute Senate House Bill 1946, um, really that talks about um, open licensing options and, uh, and, and, and then cites as examples open courseware, open textbooks, open journals, and open learning objects. So another piece of legislation that went through. We talked about the open policy, and so I won't, I won't touch on this right now, but, but really a, a critical piece to lead, leading up to the open course library. So, and by the way, the open policy says everything that we produce is CC BY. It's not just choose your open license. It's, you know, we want it as open as possible because, um, because well, it creates opportunities. Um, we talked about this in the last uh, presentation a little bit, but um, I, so for those of you who were, who were here, um, sorry for the, the duplication, but just I want to just now focus a little bit on the open course library goals. <coughs> And um, really, the, the open course library is, is about uh, four things. It's about designing and sharing 81 high enrolling courses. So we're not just tinkering around the edges. We're, we're going for, the, for the, the big courses, the courses with, uh, with the most enrollments, uh, pre-college and, and gatekeeper courses. Um, it's about improving completion rates, courses lowering textbook costs, and one of the things with the Open Course Library is that no single course can have can use materials that are over thirty dollars. So um, so that um, and, and actually most of our courses don't have any cost at all in the Open Course Library. Um, Twenty six out of the forty two have uh, zero cost. So the interesting thing about that, I'll just pause and um, insert this, but at uh, so the Sailor Foundation, so this is one of the serendipitous cool things that happens um, when, when you share. Um, but the Sailor Foundation um, came along and we sort of met up at a conference and realized that we had very similar goals. They were focused on, on delivering open content directly to learners. We were focused on creating these resources to, to give to faculty. Um, and so we both had different audiences, but really very similar goals. Um, the Sailor the Sailor Foundation folks said, "Well, gee, can we use your can we use your materials?" And we said, "Absolutely." You know, I mean, so we actually worked it out so that we were sharing with them um, even you know even before the official launch, and they've already developed a, a few of our courses into um, you know in, into more modular, student-friendly uh, kind of self-learner paced uh, courses out on their website, sailor.org. So it's just s a y l o r dot org. And um, so anyway, it's just one of those things where, in the process, they actually came back to us and said, oh, you know, you got a couple broken links back on this one course. And we're like, oh, thanks. So, so I mean, that kind of collaboration um, is just really great because it, help, it helps us, it, it helps them, but really it helps the students. I mean, that's the bottom line. So, um, so um, lowering textbook costs, oh, and, and the whole reason I got on that little soapbox was because Interestingly, and, and we're going to definitely push this in phase two in the next 39 courses that we build um, next year. The, it was the open, it was the 100% free courses that, um, that got picked up by the Sailor Foundation. So they were less interested in the $30 or less, you know, in the, in the, in the low cost textbooks, but they really grabbed on to the 100% the free. So we're going to really encourage our faculty in phase two to, to think, you know, to really think seriously about um, about the courses, with, um, about making their course have a zero cost. Um, so, anyway, the rest of this is really to get our faculty. The goal of the project: get our faculty engaged in the <coughs> movement, and um, and really provide. We're, we're providing our faculty with with additional resources that they can leverage um, to improve their own courses. 
Everything's available at opencourselibrary.org starting Monday, and we'll have a big um, press release. And there, we're we're pushing hard to make a splash out of this, only because um, really our feeling is that the more people, students, and faculty that hear about this, the greater the adoption rate will be. Um, by the way, we also have a link on opencourselibrary.org, which is called our adoption our adoption form. So that's one of the ways that we're trying to track our adoptions is that similar to, you know, when any faculty adopts a, a textbook, they fill out an adoption form. Uh, well, we, we're asking faculty who adopt our courses to fill out the adoption form. We get a little bit of information about what was, what was the cost of your last textbook, you know, are you spending anything on your new materials, and then we can sort of measure our progress as we go. Um, and. So finally, at the end of it all, um, I think the, the main thing that matters here is efficient use of public funds to increase student success and access to, to quality education and quality materials. Um, so really, all other business models um, are negotiable. We're, we're, um, we, we take all comers, uh, publishers included, and uh, we will work with anyone that will work with us. And, and really, this is our goal. So, um, at, at, at the end of it all, we want to, to, to make uh, education much more affordable in, in our state, but then why not share it out with the world? And so we're, we are selfish. We're building for our state. That's our focus. We're not building for the whole world. But you know what? Absolutely, we're willing to share that with everyone, and other people will pick it up and hopefully customize it from there. So that's, that's it, and uh, ho hopefully we have just a minute or so for questions, or a couple minutes. But uh, yeah. Okay, so you've got your community colleges and your technical colleges on board. Why don't you have your four-year universities and your research institutions? Well, so define on board, because we definitely have Well, I have mean, interest. are they, are they participating? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the Go ahead. grant came to us. <laughs> okay. We're developing okay. right. our most 81 common courses, but the four-year institutions are very interested. Um, they wanted, they've often wanted to share it in our other courses, but it was a closed system because we were on that same student mailing right. system. They weren't. You know, so this is now open. Oh, okay. The other That's thing is that they are working with us and we have to replace our learning management system and, and it's all 34 colleges and all six of our universities are working together. We'll see. If we all agree on one, but that's, they are definitely interested. We're already sharing some of the technology as well. So, yeah, they're, they're interested. It's not, you know, it's, it, it, the, the goal, the problem is figuring out how do you make it easy, you know, because there's different. All right, absolutely shocked. Um, this is a brilliant idea. Congratulations on what you've achieved here. Just fantastic to see this. Do you feel you've got a grant now to get things rolling and so forth? Do you feel comfortable long term, and I mean 10, 20 years from now, that things will be in place, that this will be owned by somebody financially to sustain it, um, or we, we, we have concerns there? That's a, yeah, we have concerns, absolutely, and actually we're designing the phase two very differently. We're doing everything in Google Docs, and we're using a Google site to organize the course materials. The reason for that is, number one, um, faculty were begging for more simplicity. I mean, they just, you know, many faculty, we were using a learning management system to create the content, and many faculty just, um, who were not familiar with that system, you know, it was spending 70% of our, of our time learning technology instead of building content. Um, but the reason we're moving to Google Docs, number one, simplicity, number two, um, I, I'm gonna put my money, if I had to bet between fill in the blank, name your learning management system, and Google, who will be there longer? Um, you know, I'm gonna put my money on Google. And, and the truth is, um, we just wanna simplify right now. We're not looking, this is not a project about creating the next whiz bang, you know, um, thing that will run on your iPad. We want it to work on everything, and, and we're not just talking about text. Um, we have a, a YouTube account, and we certainly can link out to all kinds of great resources, uh, as long as they're open. Uh, but the, the point is that, that we, um, we do have a sustainability um, uh, problem, and, and so our plan to be sustainable is designed from the beginning to, for zero money to have to be spent um, to continue. And, um, and so really we're looking for the faculty, the faculty to take ownership. We're jump-starting it with this grant, but, um, 
but if I can go into Google Docs and say save a copy and I have everything that I need, um, the chances are much greater that I'll adopt it instead of going and having to get my faculty technician to do some magic on the LMS to, to import the course. You know, our experience in the past is that the, the content that was used got maintained and the content right. that did get used. And I, I left it out. We started with 20 courses. Eventually there were there are now some 400, but some of them were dead on arrival, some didn't last long, and some are, are still living because faculty use them, they'll update them. Yeah, that's and that's, our, I mean, that's I'm not theory. beholden to the content, I'm beholden to the students. So if, if the content is still useful to the students, I want to keep it going. If the content is just content, then I don't really care if it stays alive or not. I think the, the best content will persist, and um, certainly we're still tinkering to, I mean, we still want to find the best way to, to really have ownership of the faculty to continue to, um, to keep the content up to date. If they feel like it's their course in that Google Doc, they're going to keep updating it. So thank you for attending.